Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Torquil uh, Clausen. Um, I chair WASAC. Um, and I'm very pleased to sit here this afternoon to see now almost 200 participants uh, in this important seminar. Uh, this is a seminar in a series of webinars that uh, the WASAC working groups have been conducting. For those of you who don't know, the brief story is that WASAC was created as the Global Framework for Water Scarcity in Agriculture in 2017 in Rome, at that time with 30 partners. Today we are more than 70 partners. And some of the key operating mechanisms from WASAC are our six working groups of which the most recent and one of the most dynamic indeed <laughs> is the working group on saline agriculture. In fact, that working group really um, came to fore when WASAC had its first um, forum in Praia in Cabo Verde. Uh, and um, so therefore it's very fitting. Today we have uh, ICPA as a lead of this working group present with us. Uh, we have representatives from Cabo Verde with us. And then we have some of the key partners of the working group, not least ICID and the government of Italy with us. Uh, also, I can tell you that the, the speakers you're going to meet here are all uh, excellent speakers in the area of saline agriculture. So we are in for a, an exciting one and a half hour, I hope. So with that, uh, I just, Felix, gave a couple of minutes to, <laughs> to get you 30 more participants <laughs> before you, Felix, the uh, reindeers, I don't know if that was correctly pronounced, Felix, but as the president of ICID, you will be now opening uh, this webinar. So over to you, Felix. Thank you very much, uh, Torko. I'll share my screen and just do a few slides in my presentation or my opening remarks, and then I will hand back to you. Um, so uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I trust you can all see it. Yeah, it's there. Okay, there we go. Can you all see it uh, clear? Excellent, can you hear me? Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, partner or to share with you some ideas and uh, congratulations on this webinar that you arranged on the water and soil management in uh, salt affected areas. And of course, uh, the practical solutions and tools that uh, we will hear today from uh, the different presenters. I wanted to start with the most thoughtful quotation about, and I changed it a little bit, uh, but uh, water and soil is the following. We do not inherit water and soil from our ancestors. We borrow it from uh, our children. So it's very important to realize that, uh, to have healthy soil, uh, that is the cornerstone of life. And water, of course, is also life. So if one look at the aim of the webinar, um, and that is the, to understand the major issues and the role that tailored soil management and irrigation techniques that can play in ensuring food security in such areas. So it's very important that we as partners working together, uh, presenting this webinar, and thank you to the Global Framework on Water Scarcity in Agriculture, as well as the FAO, in hosting this uh, excellent webinar. And if I just quickly uh, touch on the International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, uh, the vision is, of course, a water secure world free of poverty and hunger through sustainable rural development. And of course, it is very dependent on soil and water, uh, the irrigation part uh, of that. 
So if one look at the ICID membership over the world, uh, it, uh, at present we got 80 countries uh, spread over the world and that uh, represent approximately 95% of the irrigated uh, area of the world. And we got certain goals. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, the very first one is of great importance in terms of this webinar. And that is, of course, enable higher crop productivity with less water and energy. And if one look at the uh, st strategies to achieve that, you will see, amongst others, modernization of irrigation seams, improving of operation and maintenance of irrigation systems. And then uh, A6, uh, improving performance of uh, irrigation systems. And there's a tendency moving towards that more and more. And that is using, of course, of wastewater or poor quality water for irrigation. And that also, of course, impact on the uh, total uh, salt that has been deposited uh, in the soil. So if one look at agriculture worldwide, uh, there's about 1,533 million hectares of which rain-fed agriculture is 1,233 million hectares, and irrigated agriculture about 300 uh, million hectares. So uh, one must understand that uh, both uh, play a huge role in food security and supplying food, but it is uh, estimated that irrigated area, which is only practiced on 20% of the total agricultural area, produce about 40% of the world's food. And there's a lot of challenges. We know about the uh, threat of hunger. We know about healthy diets. The additional drivers is, of course, the population increase, the additional demand for food due to increased uh, income. And uh, according to the FAO um, and the World Water Council, they predict that the world needs to produce an estimated 60% more food by 2050 to ensure global food security. So if one look at the current trend of production, you'll see by the year 2050, there will be a gap uh, in terms of maize, at least 67%. Uh, the same with rice and wheat and soybean. And we need to have a game-changing solutions uh, to produce more with less, also uh, looking after our soils. So the success of irrigation, of course, is uh, dependent on excellent research. Uh, companies uh, like the FAO, WASAC, uh, the International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, together with our farming community uh, to uh, provide that success in irrigated agriculture. So soil health and productivity can be obtained through well-drained soils and efficient irrigation. And one knows that artificial drainage can be done, uh, but it is still not done um, enough uh, in terms of attending to that. Uh, it's been estimated that about 500,000 hectares of the total world's agricultural land are being lost out of production every year due to poor drainage. So we need to have a look at that and address that, and you will see the extent of cultivated area worldwide uh, with um, approximately 390 million hectares that is said to be provided with sustainable water management systems, either it's irrigation or drainage or both. And we need to improve on that uh, to enable us to sustain food production. And in different uh, regions, the developing uh, countries, the emerging uh, countries, you'll see the arable land, the total drained land, and also the percentage drained area. Because drainage play a significant role in terms of taking out that salts after leaching um, and, and all the different tools that has been utilized to attend to that. And we know there are many ways of managing 
of salt affected soils, either by leaching, selecting of salt tolerant crops, irrigation practices, fertilization, planting techniques, and so forth. And just a brief look, I'm from South Africa, so I need to uh, slip in a slide or two in terms of what we are doing. And that is attending uh, by means of satellite imagery. My colleagues, uh, Dr. Pete Nell, Professor John Amendel, and others are utilizing these tools to identify and uh, get the uh, salt affected areas. And you'll see the red is the salt affected areas uh, within that pivot uh, on the right hand side and how to deal with that and address that through appropriate management tools. So uh, another slide also, same type of research being done. And of course, uh, ground truthing in terms of addressing the different aspects. So it's very important uh, how we deal with that and how we address the issues at hand. And we are looking forward uh, to uh, what uh, the different presenters is going to present this afternoon to us and we need collective action and support of our partners ICID, FAO, WASAC uh, in terms of uh, our collaboration uh, is needed more than ever amongst governments, private sector, civil society organizations for joint responses building on the respective strengths and learn from each other how to manage salt affected areas because, and I'm coming back to that quotation, we do not inherit the earth or the water and soil from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Felix, uh, for these opening remarks and for that important sentence <laughs> that you repeated so we will not forget it. Um, you are rich. Um, PowerPoints will be shared, uh, and if anybody can look at it afterwards at the WASAC website. Um, and it was fitting. I see it as one of the uh, key partners of, of WASAC to open this, and I thank you so much, Felix. Uh, before we move on, let me uh, introduce uh, Amy from the uh, FAO uh, support team, just to make sure that we all understand how we are going to run this uh, seminar. So a few practical things before we get into the exciting presentations. Amy, please. Hi, everyone. This is Amy. Uh, I just wanted to make everyone aware that we have both a chat function and a Q&A function. In the chat, you can put general comments or questions. But in the Q&A, we would like you to put your technical questions for the speakers. Uh, from there, we'll draw our questions that we'll answer during the Q&A. Uh, if you have any other questions, please ask them in the chat regarding technical information or things like that, and I'll work to help answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and as uh, Amy said, if you have any questions, uh, she will respond to you. So um, uh, let me say that uh, we have a very um, tight schedule here. Uh, and all our, uh, uh, we will have first address water. Then we will have a, a short Q&A where we will address some of the questions you have posed under the Q&A function. Uh, and, um, and Jean Barotto from FAO will help us uh, picking out some of the key questions that our presenters will then respond to. Then we turn to the soil with a couple of presentations and another Q and A, and then uh, in the end, and Alaura Tusa, the FAO representative to Cape Verde, will have some closing remarks. It's a very ambitious and tight game plan. So all of the speakers have promised. So help them God that they will stay within six minutes. Uh, and to help them, um, if this would be football, this would be a yellow. Uh, just. Uh, a discreet sign at five minutes <laughs> so that you kindly wrap up in, in one minute. Because if we don't keep the time, we will run out of time, obviously. So um, with that, I will uh, hasten to uh, move on and introduce uh, our speakers. Um, the, the series, the brief biodata of all the speakers will also be on the website. So we will not spend a lot of time going into all the details. 
but many of you, of course, know Marco. Marco Acheri, the vice president from ICID. And Marco, um, you will address uh, biosaline agriculture in the context of water scarcity. So Marco, yes. please, you have the floor for six Thank minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, I will start sharing my, my video. Hope you can see it. Can you see it? We can this? see your PowerPoint, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, let's see, let's have a look, a very quick look at what is the distribution of fresh water in the world. We only have 2.5% of global fresh water available and only 0.3% of this is fresh water that is renewable. So the affected areas is a problem of uh, all over, just about all over areas of the world, of course, with some particular incidents in some of these uh, countries. Uh, the problem is that um, almost 7% of the earth is uh, affected, 20% of the world irrigated lands, of course, reduce crop productivity, soil degradation, and increase soil erosion. Australia, former USSR Republic, Argentina, along with other countries of the Middle East, are the most affected areas in the world. What is the approach we should be considering when we are dealing with the irrigation management under saline conditions? There is not a single approach. We should be considering leaching, requirement of frequency, drainage system and depth and spacing, irrigation system and scheduling, and multiple water resources use. Now, leaching requirement is very important because a very good estimate can result in a more effective water use, a reduction in the soil load needing of disposal, and substantially in a reduction of the volume of drainage water. Why it is important? Because when the leaching requirements met, the accumulation rate of salt stops increasing and the salt content remains constant over time. It's not very easy to access. This is the main problem because the drainage rate is more rather a function of the soil characteristics rather than of the water content of the soil, as we all know. This is why very important is the right choice of the drainage system the depth and the spacing of the drains, as the president also Reinders was remarking in his opening uh, interv interview. Uh, irrigation. When we're dealing with irrigation, uh, deep irrigation provides, of course, the best conditions for soil water potential because also it can avoid deep injury and salt accumulation at the wetting front. Very important is the irrigation frequency because it affects soil moisture, salinity distribution, but very well also it affects the anti-clogging performance of the deep irrigation system because it changes the funnel growth inside emitters. Limitation of course for these systems are the high initial cost, high need of constant power and water supply needs and high level of know-how. Sprinkler irrigation is something we have to consider very carefully because it can bring to burning of foliage even though the soil removal efficiency is significantly higher than with flooding or other irrigation systems such as Trico. The subsurface irrigation can be very efficient but provides no means of leaching the soil unless the soil is leached by rainfall or surface irrigation. So we consider this as not suitable over the long term, especially when salinity values are also high in the water supply. Now, a new innovative way of accomplishing percolation is by sending a low level electromagnetic signal through the irrigation water before it is applied. Of course, this changes the organization of the water molecules and behavior of the minerals so that the uh, salts are dissolved uh, and after this uh, signal, and transported down below the root zone, as you can see in this figure. And you can see here in the top, some references for this uh, particular new approach. It is published on the Journal of Soil Society of Agricultural Sciences. Of course, monitoring the water quality is very important as well as irrigation scheduling. Another approach to consider is the multiple water resources use. That means it can be used alternating good and poor quality water resources or it can be used, uh, the natural dilution, that means blending water. Finally, uh, a new approach is the solar powered water pumping and desalination, which has been used in Capo Verde. Uh, in 2019, a pilot desalination system has been installed to pump, desalinate, and distribute fresh water. It is presently working very good. 
and it shows really indeed how possible it is to create conditions for sustainable development of agriculture in rural areas who are affected by water scarcity. Some figures, some characteristics of this uh, solar powered water pumping. Up to 10,000 cubic meters per day of capacity, very low maintenance costs, remotely monitored and managed, and the final uh, produced fresh water has a very low cost that is 0.02 to 0.03 euros per cubic meter. The, the desalination system uh, also is very interesting because it desalinates any type of water, brackish and seawater, up to 1,000 cubic meters per day of capacity, low maintenance costs, remotely monitored and managed. And the final price is 0 0.2 to 0 0.50 euros per cubic meter. And this is a very short video which shows some of the, this, uh, this system that has been installed in Capo Verde. And this is it. I thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. And thank you for setting the stage by even with the video staying at almost six minutes. Very well done. And thank also uh, for this rich information you shared, uh, you have to be really sharp to remember all those slides. <laughs> but again, kindly uh, go to the uh, WASAC website and study uh, Marco's slides after there was a lot of information. And thank you for the beautiful pictures uh, and photographs from Cabo Verde. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, you can post your questions to Marco on the Q&A button, uh, any new participants. We are now more than 320 people. It's fantastic. We now turn to one of the uh, <laughs> champion members of WASAC, champions in saline agriculture, which is uh, Cabo Verde. Uh, and, and here we will uh, introduce Angela Moreno. Uh, Angela is the president of the Institute of National Research and Agricultural Development, INIDA, in Cap Verde. Uh, and Angela, I think you have been a key person in, in developing this whole uh, working group on saline agriculture. So we look forward to hearing from you. So Angela, you have the floor. I can see. Uh, good morning, all organizers, uh, facilitators, and participants. I'm very happy and thank you for to participate in this webinar. I would like to share with you some relevant aspects related to the topic water and soil management in salt affected areas of climate change case of Cape Verde. Uh, Cape Verde since 2016 still concerned with water scarcity and its impact in agriculture. The government of Cape Verde has been developing a lot of uh, cooperation in order to find the best solution related to this issue. Uh, so many actions have been uh, undertaken uh, over the past 70 years until now, namely the water mobilization. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry, Lira. This one? Yes. Ne next slide. Slide number two. Cape Verde since 2016 still concerned with water scarcity and its impact in agriculture. The government of Cape Verde has been developing a lot of cooperation in order to find the best solution related to this issue. So many actions have been undertaken over these past 17 years, 70 years. Water mobilization, soil conservation, drip irrigation system, improved seeds and firmer capacity building. The produced results have been satisfactory and the way of boosting the shifting of paradigm from subsistence agriculture to the market agriculture. Next slide, slide number three. Okay. 
recently many hydraulic infrastructure have been put in place. However, the surface water storage is still insufficient to the need of the agriculture. Have some problem? I see my slides not going. Okay, Marcos. Cap Cap Verde has been slide number three. Cape Verde has been an example of, in terms of water uh, and soil conservation. The water harvesting is still the main alternative from the better what water use in Cape Verde, mainly in the mountains in the rural areas. Okay. The groundwater has often been the water resource the more you use it to attend the water demands in agriculture and water supply for population. The exploitation of groundwater is a reality in Cape Verde and its consequences are visible. More than 40 wells have been salinized, affecting strong and negatively the crop yield and the incomes of rural family. Slide number four. Uh, what are we doing in Cape Verde to overcome the redux or reduce the salinization in soil and water? Since 2010, the Ministry of Agriculture is still doing a lot of things, namely research, constructing hydraulic, hydraulic infrastructure, training and building capacity of the farmers and technicians, washing salty soils, and monitoring flood in farmer lands to wash their soil. Slide number five. Um, <laughs> yes, many testing of crop salt tolerance and the irrigation system techniques have been implemented, uh, mainly the pitch irrigation. It's a picture now that is presented. Pitch irrigation, drip irrigation, traditional irrigation, and furrows irrigation. In order to better understand what is the most appropriate uh, solution for water and soil management in soil affected area in Cape Verde, this study uh, uh, was done in San Domingos in the uh, field from San Domingos in 2010. Uh, slide number six, uh, Cabo Verde is the uh, is decentralized water for human consumption more over than 50 years. This water represents 80% of domestic consumption in the main urban centers. After three rainless years, the government's decision was to use the decentralized water for agriculture. The idea is to use those 40 decentralized wells transform their contained breakish water into appropriate water for agriculture. Recently, NIDA has tested the economic income using the decentralized water from breakish water in agriculture in the greenhouse, and the result was very, very good. So the biosaline agriculture is now the priority project for Ministry of Agriculture. This project is currently in progress with several international partners, among them ICBA, INIDA, WASAG, OCP, universities, public and private institutions, ministry, and NGOs. Angela, you have past six minutes, so could you try to conclude? Yes, I am concluding. Thank you. The use of treaty wastewater is another technical solution that Cape Verde has been improved in order to increase the agriculture production in these lands. Cap Verde is the, is the treat wastewater, is using the treat wastewater in agriculture more than 40 years now, but we need to, to, to do this kind of water manage in the better condition. The potential of treat uh, wastewater water is about 20 cubic meter a day, and Cap Verde is just using the alpha. The idea is to mix the treat wastewater and the sanitizer water uh, to increase the crop yield and the family livelihood. Finally, the biosaline uh, bio agriculture is a good opportunity for Cape Verde, but you need to use the solar energy, the last slide, the solar energy, and desalinization of breakish, breakish water, and uh, do the harvesting of the water, and to treat this kind of water, use the salt tolerance crop, and uh, do a good manage, uh, manage of soil. All these are very important to generate employment, yield, and farming, investment. This type of agriculture needs to be profitable and capable to generate the circular economy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh.
Angela, and thank you, Marco, for at least trying to help. <laughs> um, well, uh, th these times are difficult in many ways, um, also the way in which we communicate. So, um, but Cabo Verde is a laboratory of fantastic approaches to saline uh, agriculture. So I invite you to go and have a look at Angela's uh, slides, and I'm sure Angela would be more than happy to elaborate with you um, on the mail or whatever. Thank you so much for this presentation, Angela. Um, we move now then to another uh, great supporter of WASAC, uh, the only country that has formed a, a national chapter of WASAC, which is Italy. Uh, and we now have uh, Tommaso Lezzerino, did that sound Italian? Um, here, and uh, Tommaso is from the Consortio Emiliano Romanola. I understand, Tommaso, that that is your land reclamation institute, but you may want to expand on that. So, Tommaso, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Good, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm Tommaso Italy from Land Reclamation Board in Italy, in uh, Emilia Romagna. I'm going to show what we are doing for managing saline water in a coastal area, but uh, in order to better understand the, the uh, condition of our, of our coastal zone i'm going i'm trying to uh, show a video effects and benefits of shallow groundwater table the water collected in the canals and drainage network of amelia romagna supply water to shallow groundwater systems which in recent years has suffered a strong and chronic lowering, and along the coastal zone, contrasts the rise of the saltwater surface and groundwater intrusion. In Emilia-Romagna, the 582 pumping stations are fundamental to maintain the cultivation of over 1,064,000 hectares that host the excellent productions. 199 plants are drainage pumping systems that avoid the flooding of low-lying areas. 383 are irrigation pumping systems that supply water by gravity or pressurized networks to farmers brings a further indirect benefit to agriculture, a benefit that extends over 70,000 hectares. In fact, a part of the water that flows in the channels infiltrates the ground and raises the level of the groundwater up to a distance of 100 meters. Some studies of Emiliano Romagnolo Canal have shown how orchards, arable land, and horticulture take advantage of the rise in the water table generated by water leakage from the irrigation channel. No irrigate contribution to the crops generated by water leakage from open channels. The contrast to the salt water intrusion. Moreover, the presence of tourist settlements of the Romagna and Ferrara coast exerts a strong pressure on groundwater, taking significant amounts of fresh water and increasing the saltwater intrusion, which, if not adequately countered by the action of reclamation, could create serious problems on landscape and the tourism sector. Irrigation is one method for control of saltwater intrusion. The freshwater leakage from canals create a real buffer of fresh water that protects the root systems from the underlying salt water. Last but not least, the water from open channels and ditches gives the rural environment a fundamental source of livelihood. The embankment of the canals, the spontaneous trees, the flowers, the green of our countryside would be lacking without the contribution of land reclamation consortia. Many natural. Well, I don't know if you if you have seen something, but I want to add only some few things uh, about uh, our condition in our coastal zone. One is uh, what we can see in this picture: the seawater intrusion in uh, Po Delta area can reach 15 kilometers far from the coastal line during the summer period due to the low discharge of the Po River. So in summer, we have the maximum length of the uh, seawater intrusion in surface water. Opposite happen in uh, 
ditches or a river that are the outlet of a pumping system of land reclamation boards. Because in this uh, channel, the uh, salinity is lower during the summer, like we can see here in this image. During the, the summer, the AC of the water is lower due to the activity of the pumping station. So it means that in this zone, the farmer can use this kind of water for irrigation, and this water is suitable as well for diverting water into the uh, channel in order to realize the so-called uh, artificial recharge of the groundwater system uh, with uh, water leakage from channel. In this condition, the activity of the land reclamation board is uh, focused in modeling and monitoring the interface, the interaction between shallow groundwater system, surface groundwater system, and deep groundwater system. L generally, we uh, realize, like we can see in this image, uh, uh, piezometers at different depth and, and different distance from the uh, river and channel in order to monitoring their interaction between shallow fresh water of, and groundwater and deep brackish salt water. In this image, we can see in this section, we can see this kind of monitoring. On the left side, on the top, we can see the embankment and the bed of the river. Uh, from this uh, site, there is a leakage of fresh water. That left, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yes, there is uh, the leakage of fresh water that reduces the salinization of the shallow groundwater system due to the presence of the uh, brackish to salt uh, deep groundwater. And the same happens with the irrigation that like we can see here in the dark blue zone, these produce a, a reduction of salinization of the soil. This happened as well, like you can see in this image, that uh, without uh, irrigation, we have a salinization of the soil. Like we can see here in this dark blue zone where no irrigation is applied. Uh, that's all. I really thanks uh, to uh, ICBA, to uh, YSID, to FAO, to Dr. Closen as moderator. I give you the floor. Really thanks. It will be a pleasure to reply to your uh, questions. Oh, thank you so much, Tommaso. Thank you for an excellent video uh, and, and um, an excellent presentation. Um, I saw some questions on the chat, uh, and Amy is telling you the happy news that you can actually uh, watch the videos on the WASAC website afterwards. So thank you very much for this, Tommaso. We then move from Italy to Spain uh, and, and talk about land reclamation areas of southern Spain. That would be Francisco Pedrero from the Spanish Research Council. So, Francisco, you have six golden minutes to tell us about Spain. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Torki, for your introduction. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Torki said before, I am from the south, uh, southeast of Spain, and I want to show you here in this picture that we are in the driest area of all Europe. So the rainfall is around 300 millimeters per year. So we are almost the desert. In our region, agriculture is the, as, as in the, in the, all the Mediterranean region is the main user, but also agriculture is, is a very important income in our region. And as the last 30 years was an intensive agriculture developing, we have almost 100,000 irrigated hectares that are salt affected. So almost 85% of these hectares are irrigated with a high level of salt. Here you can see a picture of our region on the, on the blue, on the blue point, you can see the different wastewater treatment plants. So from the irrigation department where I actually work, we are working since the last 20 years on different irrigation management strategies 
at different level, at farm level, at, but also at district level, working with different irrigation communities, which I want to show you now in this presentation. The two most important experimental farms that we are working since the last almost 12 years, it's one of open air, that is this citrus farm, that we are, where we are combining different deficit irrigation strategies with the use of different non-conventional water resources as salty reclaimed water. And after the seventh year of applying these techniques on this citrus farm, we start to have different toxicity problems, also on leaves, some deficiency, deficiencies of different nutrients, also on fruits, and the most important, we are losing different, uh, the different soil structure properties in this farm. So in the last five years, we were trying to recover this citrus farm using this mixing irrigation water sources and soil organic amendments in order to renew this, this soil and oxygen, the part that was almost dead. So what we, what we was, was doing is to separate the different water sources and apply the best quality water sources on the non-sensible period for, for this crop. So after 12 years, we can say that we recovered these citrus trees and it's a long, a very, from my point of view, it's a very nice long-term experiment on how to, you can also uh, reuse the saline groundwater uh, or reclaimed water sources on sensible crops like, for example, citrus. The other, the other experimental farm is uh, under greenhouse and is inside of a wastewater treatment plant. So here we are testing different, uh, as Marco saw, saw before in her presentation, we are testing different desalination prototypes with solar energy and what we are trying to do is not only to desalinate the water, we are trying to keep some of this nutrient because this prototype are focusing on reusing in agriculture, keeping the healthy part of, of the water. So also uh, in order to, on the framework you know, of the circular economy, what we are trying to do is not to, to throw the, the brine to the, to the sea, that, as was done before. So what we are doing is to irrigate different crops from more sensible to more salt tolerant crop in order to avoid any drop of water producing. And finally, I want to show you another collaboration, as I told you before, with an irrigation community. At, because when we work at big level, uh, the problems are totally different. This irrigation community, it's almost 40,000 hectares and around 10,000 members is one of the biggest in all Europe. As you can see here, the, the, they are irrigate, irrigating different crops, mainly horticulture, and the, they have a very high technology with almost 95% with drip irrigation. Here I want to show you that they are using uh, five different water resources, and as you can see on the yellow uh, bar, on the last year they are increasing using desalination water in order to reach their necessities. Here in this map, you can see on the blue line in the middle, that this is the channel where they distribute the desalination water, and the other points are the different wastewater treatment plant where they are owner of this plant in order to mix the different water resources. To mix five different water resources, it's really difficult and from the technology point of view, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a very big problem. So what, what we are doing with, uh, is a combination of research between the public and private sector in order to, to have a different interface, to have the best agronomic uh, quality from the mix of different water resources and from the economic point of view. Yeah, and the last slide is just to show you that also they are having some salinity problems, as, as Tomato, Tomaso said so before. It's in all the Mediterranean region, we have salt intrusion problems, and also here is not, it's, it's, it's totally similar. So what they are doing also is to, to develop a new drainage system to send all of this salty water to the desalination plant and trying to, to implement also the sun in agriculture in this area. Thank you very much, Torquil.
Thank you so much, Tommaso, and thank you so much for um, keeping time. Um, while we have been speaking, uh, we have received almost 40 questions from the still more than 300 participants uh, in this one. We cannot, of course, address all of these, but uh, Jean Borotro has been monitoring some of the questions to see which one we, 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 we might address uh, in the next sort of 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, and let me just, uh, Jean, I suppose that you will send me more questions, but let's start from the beginning. There was for you, I think it's for you, Felix, um, and kindly keep your answers brief. Um, there's a question here. If you know how many hectares under irrigation uh, are used for production of, of food for human consumption and how much is for animal and biofuels? Do you have a sharp, brief answer for that, Felix? <laughs> no, that's, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, that's uh, not really available. We know the global pictures of uh, the amount or area under irrigation, but not the subsections, although there are some uh, estimates on that that we could maybe share. And I believe the FAO might also have some very good uh, information on that. Okay, but do you have a ballpark? I mean, not three digits? Well, uh, we, we know uh, 300 million hectares is for irrigated agriculture. Yeah. And of course, uh, a very small percentage is for uh, the, um, uh, you could say for animal husbandry, uh, because most of that is dry land or rain fed agriculture for the uh, animal consumption. So most is uh, for human consumption. Okay, but okay, uh, a good question is one that is not easily answered. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so maybe you will think about it and and then put some response to the WhatsApp website. Uh, yes. So then, staying with uh, with ICID, Marco, um, another interesting question was this: the cost effectiveness of solar technology for diesel. Uh, how is that cost effective and can that cost go down further in the future? Well, actually, uh, that cost I showed in the slide is quite uh, very close to the edge because in, I didn't mention that the solar panels that have been used in that pilot system are very highly efficient solar panels because they also use reflected radiation. So they get a 40% more uh, of radiation uh, coming out from the uh, reflected radiation. Uh, at the moment, with this kind of technology, that's the the, the 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 shortest. I mean, edge. I mean, we can we can get. I don't think in the not in the close future we can get any lower than that. Okay. Uh, while you are there and while we are talking T cell, uh, how do you manage the reject prime? Yes, there are several ways. Uh, the most simple one, the, the pilot system I showed is very close to the sea. So the, the most, uh, I mean, the, the, the easiest way is to uh, pipe it to the sea, or you can use it like it has been doing in, uh, in Dubai. I think there are some aquaculture systems for uh, fish cultivation and something like that. So there are several ways. But of course, the easiest way is to send it to the sea by piping it into the sea. Okay, thank you so much uh, for, for responding to those. Now, um, maybe, Xiang, you are not fast enough on, <laughs> on the trigger here, so um, to send them to me, but uh, can you raise some of the key questions you received to some of the others, um, Xiang? Yes, Chair. Uh, I did send you a few questions to Thomas, so let me just uh, find them. them. So, so, so there, there is one question to Tommaso from an Italian colleague. How yeah. can we use this information on Amelia Romagna to estimate or understand climate change, if we can? Uh, can you please highlight the importance of understanding such silent drainage variabilities on summer and winter especially? This is from Mulugeta. That was a long question. Can you give a short answer to that, Tommaso? <laughs> yes, we, we, are, uh, we are carrying out with uh, different uh, projects in order to evaluate 
the effect of the water leakage from the channel on a shallow groundwater system where uh, um, maximum evapotranspiration is uh, is realized due to the to the climate and uh, um, in Italy we do not have so uh, uh, strong uh, shortage problem like in other country uh, but uh, we have this condition that are uh, controlled uh, by this uh, management of the shallow groundwater of the uh, surface water. Uh, but one other problem that we have in Italy is the um, is the uh, lowering level of the soil, uh, the, the so-called subsidence. And uh, in this case, uh, we uh, understand the, the effect of climate change with seawater intrusion, surface and uh, shallow groundwater system means understand the effect of this process on subsidence too. Because in this zone that are low laying area with the uh, uh, ground level uh, of uh, uh, from uh, minus two to minus four meter below uh, sea level, are affected by uh, subsidence as well. So uh, we need to know uh, with modeling activities uh, the uh, mixing effect of this uh, process, of this complex process. I don't know. The final, the final question is about evapotranspiration, which can be very high during summer, decreasing water use efficiency. What do you say about that? Yes, of course, that, uh, that this is the starting point to, to understand all the process. I showed only what happened in the shallow groundwater system but, uh, uh, and the interaction between surface water, but all these uh, uh, that we have seen are uh, the result of the monitoring of all climate, of all, uh, climate uh, parameters that can affect the evapotranspiration as well. So, um, of course, that uh, until we have uh, quite almost uh, good quality fresh water, uh, we focus our attention on the uh, study of the interaction between uh, the uh, groundwater. Okay, thanks a lot, Tommaso. Be before we take, and while uh, Jean, you look at, 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 at questions for the other speakers, are there any of you other speakers who have any reaction to these questions, although they were not posed to you. Then just let me know. Yeah, but Ahmed. Uh, hi, Torkel. I mean, uh, regarding the uh, using water, desalination water, actually, uh, we have a system at IGBA for, uh, it's called integrated uh, aquaculture. So uh, what we do is that we, we take the uh, rejected brine and use it to uh, cultivate uh, salt tolerance crops like uh, salicornia and take the fresh water to grow uh, vegetables and, and other uh, crops. Because it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, uh, farmers here in the middle of the desert, they are using a desalination unit and uh, they are not close to the sea. So what they do actually, they throw away the rejected brine uh, in the desert and it is very easily drained to the uh, underground water and then again increasing the, uh, the uh, groundwater uh, uh, salt concentration. So uh, one method that we use at IGBA uh, is uh, uh, integrating the uh, aquaculture. So uh, the water goes through uh, uh, fish tanks and then we have the uh, uh, organic waste from the fish tank works as fertilizer to fertilize uh, salt and crops, and then the uh, fresh water goes to the, uh, to the uh, main uh, commercial crops. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and Ahmed uh, is from IGBA, and thank you for uh, uh, giving this additional answer. Um, uh, Jean, did you get any um, questions for the other presenters, uh, Angela and Francisco? That. There is a general question uh, that has come several times on the choice of crops that are suitable for saline conditions. The choice of crops that are fitted for saline conditions. 
So, <laughs> well, that's a question that you could all respond to, but let me ask those who have not yet responded, Angela or Francisco, you want to respond to that? I think that maybe more, Angela is more especially than us, you know, in, in our region, we are just starting with biosaline agriculture. Oh, yeah. Uh, so let's move to the expert in Capo Verde. Angela, what crops are in, in Capo Verde is especially fitted for saline water? Angela. But now for the using in the saline agriculture, you are uh, using the silicornia and you have some uh, forage that is very, very good in the saline, uh, saline condition. You use also carrot, you can produce carrots, you can produce potatoes. You can produce even tomato in the saline condition. You can uh, uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, very good crop. But uh, now, uh, if we are using more than 40 wells, that is water is brackish, brackish water. And we are producing many crops that usually they produce in the uh, conventional agriculture. It's possible to grow. It depends the level of salt. Of course, you don't need to have a high level of salt. But uh, 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 after... In 2000 uh, uh, micro siemens, it's possible to grow a lot of crops in Cape Verde in condition. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and when we had the forum in Cabo Verde, I learned, which I didn't know, <laughs> that, the, that the tomatoes on saline water are actually sweeter than the other ones. Yes, more sweet. Go true. to the supermarket and buy them from Cabo Verde if you want the really sweet tomatoes. So thank you so much, Angela. Let's, we have 50 questions. We can't address them. This was just a sample of the questions uh, posed. We move, have to move on to the soils now. Uh, and for the soils, we are, we are starting with, um, with you, Sinep, um, from FAO on the uh, International Network of Salt Affected Soils. So Sinep, uh, you have the floor for six minutes. Did I pronounce your name right? Yes, it's perfect, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, let me just on full screen. So now while we are waiting, any question to pose now should be to the sword speakers and then we will have a small uh, answering session before we close. So, Sinep, um, please. Okay, well, thank you so much for giving me the floor and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share the work of the Global Soil Partnership on Soil Salinity. Uh, my name is uh, Zineb Baza, as you mentioned, and I work for the Global Soil Partnership Secretariat. So just a little bit on the partnership. Uh, it's a partnership that was established back in 2012, and it's hosted by FAO's Land and Water Division, uh, similarly to WASAG. And uh, the main objective of this partnership has been to position soils in the sustainable development agenda to improve soil governance and most importantly to promote sustainable soil management at the global level. So one of the most important works that we have at the Global Soil Partnership has been the um, publication and development of the status of the world soil resources. And uh, the reason why this is important is because it's the, the document that helped us identify, list, and classify the main threats to uh, our global soils and to soil function. And as you can see on my screen, uh, the fourth one at the global level is salinization and sodification, and it can be uh, classified even higher up in certain regions. So it's quite an important threat to our global soils that needs to be tackled. So this is something that uh, my technical colleagues have mentioned before, and I'm sure that uh, the presentations coming up will talk more about the technical details of salt-affected soils, but they occur in more than 100 countries, and they can be a huge threat to food security in many regions of the world. And now, especially with the challenges um, linked to climate change uh, and, and the challenges especially linked uh, to water availability will have a huge um, uh, and significant um, impact on salt-affected soils. 
So in this slide, we just have a few publications uh, from the Global Soil Partnership. I just mentioned the status of the world soil resources, but we also have uh, the Voluntary Guidelines for Sustainable Soil Management, which is a great document that has a list of management practices that you can use to prevent, to minimize, and to mitigate soil salinization. Uh, we also have a handbook for saline soil management, which is quite a technical manual that came after uh, many case studies um, that took place in the Central uh, Asian region. And then we also have some policy briefs on salt-affected soils and on soils in general for the Near East and North African region where salt-affected soils are quite uh, an issue. Uh, and in addition to all the work that the Global Soil Partnership is doing to tackle salt, so, soil uh, salinity and salt-affected soils, uh, we have also decided to establish the international network of salt-affected soils. So within the GSP, we have uh, a few networks. So for example, we already have the International Network of Black Soils, which are uh, soils that are very high in uh, soil organic carbon. We have a network on global soil laboratory networks. And in order to better address the important threat of salt-affected soils, we have decided to also develop the International Network of Salt-Affected Soils, or INSAS, and the main objectives are really to promote the sustainable management of salt-affected soils at the global level. Uh, we would also like to develop a report on the global status, the trends, and the challenges that, that these soils are facing. Um, and, you know, we, we have a lot of data on salt affected soils, but a lot of it is outdated. So this is really something that we need to, to work on and, and to work on together uh, to develop and provide a set of good practices for the sustainable management of salt affected soils. So these, we already have them. We need to compile them. We need to make them available to all and mostly to provide a platform for countries, institutions that are working on salt affected soils to really get together and to discuss the common issues that they have, to discuss the management practices and to really share all of this. Um, and then we also have a, the, the GSP is also working on a global soil salinity map. Uh, so we have already published back in 2017, the global soil organic carbon map. Uh, and this is these maps that we are developing at the GSP, they are uh, country driven. Uh, so basically the countries, member countries are working on their map and then uh, through a bottom up approach. And then we combine all these maps together to create a global soil salinity map. Um, and right now we are at the training phase. So we offer capacity development trainings. Uh, unfortunately, right now we have to do, to do them online, but we are pretty much wrapping up uh, these trainings. Uh, we have been able to reach over 120 countries. We have done trainings for almost all of the regions at this point. And uh, countries have been able to work using their data on the development of their own soil salinity maps. So we are very- One minute left. Okay, we are very uh, happy and looking forward to have this map uh, shared with all of you, hopefully by the end of 2020. And this is just a, a screenshot of, of the trainings that we were having. This one was happening a couple of weeks ago uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa. And the last thing that I want to mention is that we are also hosting, uh, every year we work on a symposium on different soil threats and the next one that we will be having in 2021. It was supposed to happen in 2020, but we are moving it uh, due, due to the current situation, uh, the global symposium on salt affected soils. And this is something that we are doing with the Republic of Uzbekistan. So it will be happening from the 13th to the 16th of September in 2021 in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. So keep tuned, uh, stay tuned with the work of the GSP for more information. And uh, yeah, finally, if you want to become a member of INSAS, if you or your institution, member, country, uh, have any questions about this network, if you would like to join or if you have any work on the, on the work of, any question on the work of the GSP, you can send me an email or send an email to the GSP secretariat. Thank okay. you very that, much for your attention. That was a commercial on Zoom, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I can underwrite that commercial and I think uh, you, uh, Sinep showed you a lot of rich material that will be, uh, I mean, you can access it through WASAG and FAO website. Uh, there was a lot of information. Thanks a lot, Sinep. Uh, now we move to Ahmed. You saw Ahmed posing a question. I know that 
Ahmed got his PhD from Copenhagen, so that must be an excellent presentation. And, and people from that part also know how to manage time. So you have six minutes, Ahmed, to talk to us um, about lessons learned from saline soil management and salinity agriculture projects. Please, Ahmed. Hi. Uh, so I will do my best, uh, Torquil, to uh, retract myself to the time. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, present some of the uh, learning lessons from during uh, from the uh, saline uh, soil rehabilitation projects. Uh, probably you know the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture is involved in many international uh, projects, mainly in, in Asia and in Africa, in order to uh, help and improve the livelihood of marginal uh, farmers living in marginal uh, soil by introducing climate resilient uh, crops in order to uh, improve the, the health and improve the uh, give more uh, employment opportunities specifically for uh, youth and for women and also of course to uh, reduce land degradation or at least to stop the soil uh, deterioration so i'm going to uh, share with you only briefly some of the uh, key lessons and also uh, challenges that we uh, came up with from our projects and also from other projects. As my uh, colleague Zainab mentioned that uh, soil sanity is actually is a global uh, problem. It's happening uh, everywhere, but unfortunately, a few studies investigated the economical impact of the soil degradation due to uh, soil sanity. Part of that is due to actually the lack of information on the soil sanity itself. So it's very good that we will expecting uh, soon enough uh, soil sanity. I'm, at, I'm getting a message that maybe you should speak a little bit louder. Somebody has difficulty. Could you speak a bit louder? Okay, I, I will do my best. Uh, so uh, uh, the, I, I'm saying that uh, unfortunately the impact of the soil sanity on the uh, economy is not yet clear. There are many studies actually uh, on the uh, impact of soil sanity on the crop uh, reduction production or uh, crop productivity, but not on the economy, especially on uh, a global uh, level. We also know that uh, there is a difference in how developed and developing countries are uh, treating with soil uh, rehabilitation. Uh, soil rehabilitation projects is very costly and it needs, uh, it needs a national efforts, it needs uh, uh, support from government, so developed countries actually they always have long-term approaches they have sustainable techniques including environmental impact assessment value chain studies socio-economic studies uh, they have also large scale uh, projects and also they support farmers uh, and stakeholders with regulations and and policies this is unfortunately is lacking or missing uh, for some degree in the uh, developing uh, countries also, the, uh, the strategies for soil rehabilitation or saline soil rehabilitation in, 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 in developed and developed and developing countries, they are different. So in developing countries, we, we see some uh, methods like saline agriculture, uh, salt tolerant crops, uh, breeding programs, soil amendments. But in developed countries, we see more like uh, engineering solutions, uh, transgenes and genome editing microbial uh, methods because it needs a lot of research, it needs a lot of uh, money. Uh, there are many uh, methods or strategies for, uh, for soil uh, rehabilitation, saline soil rehabilitation, but of course using them depends on the uh, context and ecosystem and uh, uh, the economical uh, situation. In, in, in this project that was led by ICBA in Pakistan in order to introduce salt tolerant uh, forages, uh, in Pakistan, I mean, the soil scientists uh, found that uh, the soil uh, situation or soil have uh, argelic horizon that is very rich in, in clay. So it is not enough to give, for example, only uh, irrigation, but uh, a mechanical intervention is needed. Uh, uh, some uh, soil amendments is needed, like gypsum, in order to improve the soil. Otherwise, uh, salt will form uh, a crust and then it will not allow uh, the forages seedlings to, to grow. The message here is that actually detailed soil assessment is needed prior to 
uh, Saline Agriculture Project Establishment. So uh, this is a conclusion from this slide that we need detailed soil assessment uh, and soil uh, comprehensive soil survey prior to the establishment of a Saline Agriculture uh, Project. This is another uh, research from uh, Egypt and it shows actually the importance of the studying the soil uh, variability, the special variability. When we have One better, minute left. when we have a, a better information about uh, the soil, we will have reduced cost for uh, reclamation or rehabilitation. We will have more water saving because we will use more site-specific management, not uniform management. So uniform management will cost us more water, will cost us more money and uh, will be less efficient. Also for the uh, saline uh, agriculture as approach, uh, it is very effective approach for phyto extraction of the salt from the soil, but also we have to consider that it is long-term uh, approach. It requires time and requires resources and requires also more socio-economical studies to make it a sustainable uh, approach that can be used in uh, saline uh, areas. And also we need more studies on the uh, on the soil ecosystem because there are some studies shows that there is a change in the soil microbial community in those study in those soils after cultivating salt tolerant crops so briefly the main challenges challenges is the the requirement for national policies to support farmers in saline soils the accurate assessment of the implication of the soil salinization on food security and national uh, economy, creating a value chain for salt tolerant crops and halophyta uh, in saline agriculture systems to improve its sustainability. Farmers and the stakeholders in developing We're countries- We're trying to wrap up now. Uh, Ahmed, we can't go through all these now. Uh, so could you try to wrap up? Yes, yes. Thank so, you. Uh, farmers, they require access to data and technical uh, support and the selection of soil management approach uh, should be based on accurate soil and water uh, assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, for, for this uh, rich presentation uh, on soils. I'm, I'm happy to see that um, most of the people have stayed with us when we move from water to soil. So the water people are keen to learn about soils. That's good. Uh, the last we have is Professor Todd from, um, from Hungary. Uh, Kerge among friends, uh, and uh, you are going to talk to us um, about bio-based fertilizers, right? So, Professor Todd, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. I just had to unmute my uh, microphone. And, That's a good uh, idea you... when you want to speak. Yes. Uh, I think it's better if you uh, <laughs> if you want to be heard. <laughs> You know, my old friend, uh, who's the rector of our university, Professor Gao, said that you have to be loud enough to be heard and you have to be short enough to be loved. So I try to be uh, concise. <laughs> I just I don't know how Thank to... You. See. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you see my screen in a, in a double window screen, now. Yes. But uh, maybe... Uh, we can see it. Yeah, anyway. So, uh, please focus on the left side. I don't know how to deal with this. This is the first time when I see that. But anyway, I'm, I'm talking about the potentials of bio-based fertilizer uh, in the management of uh, saline areas, especially for nutrient management, but also with regards to the soil properties, which of course cannot be detached really. Uh, for the hydrophysical properties and also the uh, water management and also from the nutrient management of the agricultural uh, practice. So we have a, 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 a small mission statement of, uh, or, uh, which says that increased synergies of resources effic use efficiency and environmental sustainability within circular economy. Now we are more and more talking about the circular economy, uh, which is uh, actually to close the uh, nutrient cycles uh, across not only the, uh, the the farming practices but also across the entire economy 
And uh, this e economy also includes uh, nutrient-rich side streams uh, from the cropping itself, but also from some household and also from some industrial waste. So uh, when we talk about the bio-based fertilizer, we have to consider all possible sources of uh, nutrients, which then can be used in a safe way on the field. And then, of course, uh, bioavailability and agronomic efficiency are in the, uh, in the focus because uh, before being, uh, without being efficient, it's uh, not very likely to be used. And the uh, main underlying principle of uh, efficiency is that if these uh, fertilizers or at least the nutrient part of it uh, will be available for crops. For that, we also need uh, good technologies. And of course, these technologies have to be applied in a site-specific way. And then, of course, uh, all these bio-based fertilizer have to uh, be uh, applicable to improve the overall condition of soil. And with that, we can also mitigate uh, the soil threat, not only salinization, although our focus today is salinization, but also other soil threats. Uh, like uh, it can be also the aridification, the erosion, uh, loss of organic carbon, and so on. Uh, when I was uh, uh, talking about this, uh, this uh, circular economy, uh, that is uh, what we also apply in a project which is called Next for Bio. It's a new uh, EU funded uh, project. Uh, which is uh, focusing both on prime land and marginal land, which includes also problem land. Marginal lands are not necessarily those uh, which have a, a degradation of problem, but those which are less fair planned. And but here in uh, in the salinity uh, theme, we have uh, both uh, low fertility and the uh, and the problem of uh, further degradation. So this uh, saline issue, salinity issue, classes applies to both. I'm not going again to detail of the circular economy. Uh, you know it uh, quite well. Uh, but uh, maybe a, a few uh, small insight to this uh, Lex for Bio project where we were collecting uh, the available bio-based fertilizer, which are already there on the market. But we also made a good uh, search of the literature. Uh, what are the, uh, the, the, uh, the fertilizers uh, which uh, are uh, on the, on the uh, study or on the investigation in, in the scientific uh, uh, activities. And then uh, we can uh, classify this by the physical properties, sorry for the typo, physical properties of the product, also the uh, production pin principle, whether it's uh, uh, produced by pyrolysis or, or uh, other, other methods. And uh, also by the availability, whether uh, you can access these products worldwide or only uh, locally uh, where it is produced. Uh, also, what is the, uh, the, the safety or potential environmental risk uh, with, in terms of, uh, of the, of the uh, composition? And also, of course, the price, because uh, if it's not uh, uh, economically viable, it won't be used. So these are the these are the uh, aspects which are uh, which are looked at uh, at this bio-based fertilizer and yeah here just one a minute, selection uh, one minute okay one minute so, so we 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 went through the range of uh, of uh, of uh, fertilizer which are already available and uh, we selected the a handful of them uh, which can now are uh, investigated on field trials and then uh, we hope that we can come up uh, with uh, uh, good uh, <coughs> recommendations uh, for the use also on, on uh, saline lands uh, in terms of uh, nutrient release, also for improvement of soil structure and hydrophysical properties, at least in, in, in European uh, saline areas, but I, I think it's uh, also the case for, uh, for coastal areas that soil structure is one of the issue which has to be tackled in order to uh, provide better conditions for cropping. And uh, with that uh, one, uh, of course, here, the soil physics and soil chemistry are very much go hand in hand. So we have to uh, go and exchange the, uh, the salts which are soft. And uh, of course, accessibility is, is more, more, more uh, a practical issue, just as well as economic efficiency. 
and then uh, we will see how all this can be used in in a, in, a, in a technological uh, uh, chain of uh, production and soil management. Uh, we have some ideas. I can maybe answer in the Q and A session for further issue if you if you want. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kage, for this uh, presentation. And again, uh, we have. A few minutes left before I at uh, four thirty turn over to uh, uh, for the closing by Anna Laura. But uh, just before uh, uh, Jean Borotto, we received sixty six questions um, on the Q and A. Just tell us how now sixty seven. <laughs> how will these questions be responded to, Jean? Jan Barotto. Jan, please unmute your mic. Okay, you can answer, Rosida, maybe. Okay, yes, we will, uh, we will collect all the questions and then we will give them to the speakers so they will have the opportunity to reply and then we will put them online on our website. So all the people that ask questions can check our website and find their answer. Okay, and we got a lot of questions, so there was a lot of interest. Uh, we can maybe entertain one general question. Uh, Zhang, you would go through that, but you have you disappeared? I'm um, here, Chair. Okay, Shang, just one yeah. general question that comes up on source. What could that be? Yeah, someone asked to Ahmed, what crops or plants are used for phyto extraction or soil remediation? Is that a general question, you think? I think it will educate us. Okay, Ahmed. I am I'm not actually a plant scientist, but uh, from our experience at, at IGB, actually, uh, uh, Calicornia also is, is good for phyto uh, extraction. There are, I mean, uh, uh, salt, uh, salt tolerant crops. Uh, as I mentioned, they are, they, maybe they are efficient in, 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 in phyto extraction, but it needs a lot long term. So it needs years because uh, what they extract from the soil it's very small portion uh, of the salt compared to the existing uh, salt in the soil. So it needs uh, maintenance and it needs sustainability. Okay. Thank you so much. I understand that was a question for Zineb, uh, Jean. That's the last one we can take. Yeah. To Zineb, are there any methods for decreasing salt concentration in soils? You got the question, Zineb? Yes, I heard that. Thank you. Uh, well, there is many. Flushing uh, through irrigation water is one of the ones that's mainly used, but it's, it's not one that we can always um, uh, adopt in areas of water scarcity. But I'll just give you an example from the voluntary guidelines of sustainable soil management. So we have, for example, surface cover should be optimized to reduce evaporation losses. So evaporation loss is already something that was mentioned earlier uh, in the session. Uh, it's something that joins both soils and water and something that should really be considered in salt uh, affected areas. Okay, now, obviously with now 70 questions on the screen, this was only a sample of the type of questions you get and the type of answers you get. So thank you for responding and thank you in advance to all our presenters for taking the trouble afterwards now to respond to the question posed to you so that this process can continue. And of course, uh, we have had 300 people, more than 300 people here, and we, we hope this would have given you uh, an appetite <laughs> for following the work on saline agriculture through WASAG and our working group. So, um, I, for one, think this has been uh, 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 brief, but brief and sweet, as you say, and very rich, and there's a lot to look at. So with that, I will turn to uh, the FAO representative in uh, Cabo Verde, um, Anna Laura Tuza, uh, for some closing remarks. Anna Laura, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and congratulations to the panelists. All have provided innovative technologies and practices focused on the water and or the soil perspectives. 
The examples presented are trying to solve a key question. How to establish a modern and efficient agriculture and providing food products under a hard natural conditions. As you heard from the presentations, Cabo Verde is at the core of these activities. As a sociologist myself, these innovative technologies raise questions from the social and economic point of view. We need to reconcile technology and the human side to have all the ingredients to succeed. Are these technologies and practices gender sensitive? Could these technologies reach smallholder farmers in a way that even the poorest farmer could benefit? Does the use of these technologies imply additional costs that might eventually affect the prices of the food produced? Do, recip do recipient countries have the regulations and institutions in place to facilitate a sustainable and inclusive use of desalinized water and soil management? We look forward to further collaboration with this working group in the framework of WhatsApp. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna Laura. And don't leave yet because I have a uh, happy announcement. And the happy announcement is that uh, other working groups are also having webinars. There will one be one in a few days on the 9th of June at the same time at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, bridging the financing gap for the NDCs in agriculture under climate change. You know, the NDC is a national determined contribution to the Paris Agreement. So don't miss that one. And thanks again uh, for your participation. Uh, and please do visit the website and continue with us uh, on this important issue. So thank you very much. The webinar is closed. Thank you.